So, uh, welcome, Chief Justice, other distinguished guests and audience members to this, the 22nd Annual WA Lee Equity Lecture 2021. For those of you who don't know me, this is what I look like, uh, and I'm the Dean at Law at UQ and the current holder of the Sir Gerard Brennan Chair in Law, Rick Bigwood is my name. On behalf of the University of Queensland and Queensland Community Foundation, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship of the land on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise the valuable contributions to Australia and global society. It's a considerable honour and pleasure for the TCB, uh, TC Burn School of Law to be able to sponsor this year's lecture as Tony Lee has had a long-standing association with the school, having been a member of its teaching and research staff from 1965 until his retirement in 1989. UQ law colleagues of my vintage still recall being taught equity, trust and succession by Tony and speak of him to this day with unfailing fondness. I've not myself met Tony, but have, will have the pleasure of doing so tomorrow when I drive up to the Sunshine Coast to um, be privy to the bestowing of, of, the, of his UQ fellowship. Can also take the moment, a moment to thank Professor Andrew Griffiths, my boss and the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Business, Economics and Law at UQ, as he agreed to assist the law school by funding half of the sponsorship for uh, this evening's event. Uh, he did so on the proviso that I mentioned the advancement campaign for the UQ Pro Bono Centre, which uh, has been fundraising this year with a view to expanding the centre's important activities beyond Brisbane into the more into more regional, uh, rural and remote parts of Queensland. To date, we have raised over $160,000 under the campaign. If anyone's interested in knowing more about the centre and, and how they might support it, just feel free to uh, contact me directly. I should also like to thank the Business Economics and Law Marketing Engagement Events team for their assistance in making this event happen this evening in conjunction with the Queensland Community Foundation. Truth to tell, I, I sprung this all on them uh, very, uh, very short notice and for a team within the faculty that is extremely stretched for resources, particularly at this time of the year, they came to the party with um, surprising uh, cheer and good grace and so I'm grateful uh, for that. And, and, um, their support of the law school is always greatly appreciated. Another reason why the law school was extremely keen to sponsor this year's lecture was because of its speaker. It's not my role to introduce the speaker to you, but I will at least publicly acknowledge the fine work of the Honourable Justice Sarah Derrington as, former, uh, as the former Dean of UQ Law that I now head. Justice Derrington is largely responsible for the incredible reputation that the school now enjoys both domestically and internationally, and she drove the reimagination campaign that now accounts for the world-class facilities in the Fogg and Smith building on campus, our small cohort seminar style undergraduate law program, and a number of significant scholarships that the law school now offers to students who experience financial need or other manifestations of personal or educational disadvantage. She was also the dean who hired me to the UQ Law School, so perhaps her record's not as completely unblemished as it might otherwise appear. Anyway, as I said, it's not my function uh, this evening to introduce the speaker to you. Uh, that role has been assigned to the Honourable Chief Justice Catherine Holmes AC. I now invite the Chief Justice to the lectern to introduce Justice Derrington to you. Well, welcome all of you to the Banco Court for the 22nd WA Lee Equity Lecture. I hope I may be welcoming Tony Lee online, my former succession lecturer, if he is able to stream in, but uh, otherwise it, it seems he'll be able to watch a video recording of the whole event. Uh, I welcome my judicial colleagues, state and federal, the Honourable Margaret McMurdo, Chair of the Queensland Community Foundation, representatives of QCF, distinguished academics, including, of course, Professor Bigwood, uh, and fellow practitioners. Now, I am going to have the pleasure of introducing Justice Sarah Derrington to deliver tonight's lecture. But before I go on with her honours introduction, can I mention two brief things? 
One is that I'm not actually able to stay for the lecture, although I have had the considerable privilege of reading it in advance. That's because I'd previously committed to a dinner for retired women judges, from whom I may have something to learn. It is disappointing because I've been attending these lectures for years, and this, I'm going to miss this as a first, but I am going to have to tiptoe away. The second preliminary matter is this. I've been asked to point out that there are raffle tickets being sold by QCF in order to support the work of Law Right, which I'm sure you know is a very worthy organisation helping unrepresented litigants and running a variety of worthwhile programs for vulnerable people. Apart from virtue, the reward for buying a ticket is the chance to win a $5,000 Paspaley Pearls voucher. If you don't wear pearls yourself, it is guaranteed to make someone who does love you. <laughs> so I encourage you to buy up big. Now turning to Her Honour, I think that we first met in 1991 in Cairns when she was a heavily pregnant judge's associate and I was an even more heavily pregnant barrister. The judge was on edge for the whole trial. <laughs> I don't think he was used to being surrounded by so much fecundity, let alone his concern let that you know, one of us would actually reach the point. But anyway, apart from not being pregnant, Her Honour has not changed all that much since that time. She was a remarkably poised and intelligent young woman, and she is a remarkably poised and intelligent older woman. <laughs> She has impressively combined the practising and academic sides of the law, practising at the bar while undertaking first her LLM and then her PhD in marine insurance law. She became Professor of Admiralty Law at the UQ Law School and in 2013 was appointed as its Dean. And as you've heard from Professor Bigwood, uh, and as I endorse, she really earned the admiration of all of us for the way she rejuvenated the law school, both physically and in academic terms. Justice Derrington left that role to become a federal court judge and assumed an additional role, perhaps a little less difficult than taking on the deanship of the law school, but certainly with its very own special complications as president of the Australian Law Reform Commission. That position has given her an excellent vantage point from which to give tonight's lecture because she may actually be undertaking a report into her subject matter. You'll have seen from the topic, which with all due respect is a slightly tortured paraphrase of Juliet's monologue, that it concerns equity and fairness. Her Honour raises the questions whether equitable concepts might be pressed into service to lend some clarity to the tangled world of financial service regulations and whether the idea of fairness is actually useful in that context. I can tell you that the lecture is a deeply interesting discussion of those issues. I can also tell you it's not quite as romantic as Romeo and Juliet, but it ends better. <laughs> Justice Derrington. Well, thank you, Chief Justice, uh, and I hope you enjoy your dinner. <laughs> so, the Honourable Margaret McMurdo, Professor Bigwood, Mr John de Groot, ladies and gentlemen, and last but not least, Mr Tony Lee, if you are listening. I'm sincerely humbled to have been asked to deliver the 2021 WA Lee Lecture in the series that honours the contribution of Tony Lee to the legal academy and the legal profession. Many of you in attendance this evening will have had the good fortune to have been taught by Tony Lee, as Professor Bigwood has already alluded to. I certainly did in both equity and trusts and succession. I tried to emulate some of his methods when I began teaching, particularly the requirement that students be prepared before attending tutorials. I'm afraid that by the 20 teens, that was a lost cause. One of the things that captured my imagination is the perhaps apocryphal fact that Tony attended kindergarten with another trust scholar who was very kind to me as a junior academic, Professor Derek Davies, the founding law fellow at St Catherine's College, Oxford, but who sadly is no longer with us. 
I have often wondered whether it was the quality of the teaching at that Welsh kindergarten or merely something in the water that inspired similarly outstanding scholarship on either side of the globe. The Academy owes a great debt both to Tony and to Derek and to Wales. The impetus for my topic this evening, again, as the Chief Justice has alluded to, is the current work of the Australian Law Reform Commission in its inquiry into the legislative framework for financial services and corporations law. The aim of this work is to reduce legislative complexity to facilitate an adaptive, efficient and navigable framework of legislation within the context of existing policy settings. I posit that one way of achieving this aim might be through reliance on equitable doctrines and remedies rather than statute. The origin and history of equitable jurisdiction has been recounted by numerous scholars over the centuries since its emergence in the 14th century. This paper cannot and does not seek to add to that wealth of scholarship. Rather, it seeks to explore the extent to which the indeterminate language of fairness, identified by Commissioner Hayne in the Royal Commission into Financial Services Misconduct, is a fundamental norm of behaviour, and whether that might suborn the application of settled principles of equity in the context of financial services law and regulation. It also asks whether statutory recognition of those settled principles, as has occurred in relation to unconscionable conduct, would simplify the statutory law and perhaps, counterintuitively, create greater certainty than is provided by the plethora of pointless, technical and befuddling statutory provisions scattered over many acts in defined situations. Since Lord Mansfield's observations in 1774, that the great object in all mercantile transactions should be certainty. It remains the case that commercial law must be certain, but it must also be fair and just, simple and practical, but comprehensive, and it must be able to be employed and enforced without undue expense, delay or confusion. That is not the general experience of those who engage regularly with financial services legislation. Justice Mark Leeming has argued that the ethically normative principles of equity, often associated with value judgments, arguably create greater certainty than the more rigid rules of the common law in complex areas. He points particularly to the operation of rules in complex environments such as corporations and taxation law, citing Professor Braithwaite's observations that such rules will have a penumbral area of uncertainty to which wealthy legal game players aim for the penumbra, play the game in a way that expands the gray area of the law. This is sometimes described as creative compliance or compliant non-compliance, essentially box ticking. The very conduct of the bank that led to the decision of the High Court in Westpac and ASIC being an example of this type of creativity. Similarly, Chief Justice Alsop has said, sometimes a rule can only be expressed at a certain level of generality, often involving a value judgment. To do otherwise and to seek precise rules for all circumstances may be to risk complexity, incoherence and confusion, a matter that the ALRC inquiry has found to be so in the context of our current inquiry. The Chief Justice's statement also resonates with Lord Ellesmere's explanation of the underlying rationale for the very existence of equitable principles and doctrines in the Earl of Oxford's case in 1615, where Lord Ellesmere said, the cause why there is a chancery is for men's actions are so diverse and infinite that it is impossible to make any general law which may aptly meet with every act and not fail in some circumstances. Now, the suite of Commonwealth statutes that provides for consumer protection in relation to financial products and services and that regulates the market for those products and services is comprised in the main of the Corporations Act, the National Consumer Credit Protection Act and the Australian Securities and Investments Commission Act. Of relevance too are the protections within the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act and the obligations arising under the Insurance Contracts Act and the Marine Insurance Act. 
These various statutes are not simply concerned with contractual arrangements, but are also necessarily concerned with complex equitable constructs, such as the trust arrangements underlying superannuation funds, investments in financially engineered products or in derivatives, forms of securitization, and many other forms of modern capital raising, which depend upon the doctrines of equity for their very existence. The complexity of the financial services ecosystem cannot be underestimated. The size and diversity of Australian financial markets has increased from 4.3 trillion in 2001 to 19.5 trillion in 2021. Particular markets, such as those for derivatives and employee share schemes, have exploded from 120 billion in 2001 to 727 billion in 2021. Australian financial markets and the, and the nature of their participants are under constant evolution. Unsurprisingly, the legislature lags behind the entrepreneurs and is engaged in a constant cycle of amendments to the statutes, the regulations and the creation of legislative instruments, including to exempt or exclude emerging products and services from, from provisions of the law that are no longer fit for purpose. It has become a game of whack-a-mole which explains its growth from 445,996 words in 2001, and no, I didn't count them, to today's count at 805,821 words, the second largest Commonwealth statute. No prizes for guessing what the largest one is. This is precisely the type of environment in which the flexibility of equitable doctrines and remedies is essential. The length and complexity of the financial services legislation is, however, also a consequence of a tendency, almost a mania, to deconstruct, to particularise, to define to the point of exhaustion and sometimes incoherence. This is particularly so in relation to the regulation of financial services, which is sub subject to rules, protocols and checklists, which often obscure the underlying conduct to which such rules are directed. Obligations in the Corporations Act alone are numerous and widely dispersed. Approximately 1,495 sections require that something must be done. The failure to comply with existing conduct obligations and broader community expectations concerning the conduct of financial services entities was well documented in the Royal Commission. It found that conduct by many entities had broken the law or fallen short of the kind of behaviour the community not only expects of financial services entities, but is also entitled to expect of them. It's therefore not surprising that the Corporations Act has consistently been among Commonwealth statutes most frequently considered by the Commonwealth and New South Wales courts, including the New South Wales Court of Appeal. The Royal Commission noted that industry community groups and regulators agreed the current law is too complex. The Royal Commission seemed to consider that a clearer body of law, particularly as concerns the conduct obligations of financial services entities, may lead to better compliance, noting that the more complicated the law is, the harder it is to see unifying and informing principles and purposes. The current statutory regime does not identify expressly which unifying and informing principles and purposes are being pursued in the various detailed rules and prescriptive provisions of legislation. There's also a significant overlap and duplication among statutes, which detracts from clarity, simplicity and certainty. The provisions relating to prohibited conduct and through which individuals and corporations may be subject to civil and or criminal penalties are particularly opaque. The Royal Commission recommended that, as far as possible, legislation governing financial services entities should identify expressly what fundamental norms of behaviour are being pursued when particular and detailed rules are made about particular subject matter. Six fundamental norms of behaviour were, were identified by Commissioner Hayne. The first was to obey the law. The second, not to mislead or deceive. The third, to act fairly. The fourth, to provide services that are fit for purpose, 
the fifth, to deliver services with reasonable care and skill, and finally, when acting for another, act in the best interests of that other. Commissioner Hayne also observed that these six fundamental norms are all reflected in the existing law, but that reflection is piecemeal. They are reflected in the general obligations of holders of an Australian Financial Services Licence under the Corporations Act, the general obligations of holders of an Australian Credit Licence under the NCCP Act, the provisions of the ASIC Act, the obligations of a registrable superannuation entity, and in the obligations of utmost good faith on both insureds and insurers under the Insurance Contracts Act and the Marine Insurance Act. But it's important that we understand the role or purpose that the fundamental norms are expected to have in the legislative structure. Commissioner Hayne described them as fundamental precepts. He observed that statutes have often given legislative expression to fundamental precepts, but with little textual analysis. He suggested by way of example, the detailed rules about conflicts of interest and conflicted remuneration should be expressly identified as giving effect to the principle that when a person is acting for another, the person must act in the best interests of that other. But to identify them simply as fundamental precepts does not necessarily assist. One question that may arise is whether a fundamental norm or precept imposes a legal duty that sounds in damages for breach or some other remedy. A straightforward example of how a fundamental precept operates at a higher level than a rule is Section 23 of the Marine Insurance Act. Whilst it is often described as the duty of utmost good faith, breach of that duty does not sound in damages, rather the contract will be void because the fundamental precept on the basis of which the contract was made, utmost good faith, has been shown not to exist. The contract therefore cannot stand. A misunderstanding of the role played by the fundamental norms can lead to suspicion or distrust about the practical operability of those norms. Whether referred to as principles or fundamental norms of behaviour, the effect is the same. They are an informing norm or organising principle, not a separate implied term. For example, if good faith is simply a term implied in fact, it can itself be construed and applied and found a separate head of damages. This then opens up arguments about whether the principles of BP Refinery Western Port and the Shire of Hastings have been satisfied, or whether entire agreement clauses operate to the exclusion of good faith. If, however, good faith is recognised as an informing but binding principle or duty, a means by which the court can recognise and give effect to an expected standard of behaviour, then there is no debate as to whether or not the principle is applicable. It is simply a basic assumption of all contractual dealings. At least since the time of the commercial statutes drafted by Sir Mackenzie Chalmers, statutes have created norms of conduct expressed generally as commands for an expected standard of behaviour in relation to commercial transactions. Examples include Section 23 of the Marine Insurance Act referred to earlier and the circumstances in which there is an implied warranty or condition in relation to fitness for purpose of goods or merchantable quality in the sale of goods acts of the early 19th century. More recently, Section 52 of the now repealed Trade Practices Act provided that a corporation shall not, in trade or commerce, engage in conduct that is misleading or deceptive, or likely to mislead or deceive. And this prescription, of course, is now found in Section 18 of the Australian Consumer Law and in Section 101, 1041H of the Corporations Act and in Section 12DA of the ASIC Act. Modern commercial statutes eschew generally expressed norms for detailed prescription. In equity, norms and values permeate as maxims, principles, doctrines and rules. Equitable intervention is, in commerce is not exceptional. One of those norms is a rejection of unconscionable conduct. The statutes with which we are concerned all involve contracts for some type of financial service or product, 
Some of the provisions apply only to consumers, Other, others apply generally. Where they apply generally, certain direct competitive and self-interested aspects of commerce may negate, limit or constrain the applicability of equitable principles. By their very nature, these types of contracts involve risk. In Cobelt, Justice Keane observed that the purpose of Section 12CB of the ASIC Act is to regulate commerce and that the pursuit by those engaged in commerce of their own advantage is an omnipresent feature of legitimate commerce. The conduct obligations contained throughout financial services legislation can be divided broadly into two categories prohibited conduct and positive obligations. Prohibited conduct refers to the various proscriptions contained in the Corporations Act and the ASIC Act on conduct that is misleading or deceptive, unconscionable both within the meaning of the general law and by virtue of statute, imposes unfair contract terms or involves unfair practices, including making false or misleading representations about products or services or certain business activities. These prescriptions apply generally and are not limited in their scope to financial services licensees. Broadly, the prescription of such conduct is reflective of at least three of the fundamental norms identified by Commissioner Hain: to obey the law, not to mislead or deceive, and to provide services that are fit for purpose. Positive obligations are created by the NCCP Act and the Corporations Act which impose an obligation on credit and AFS licensees respectively to do all things necessary to ensure that the activities authorised by their licence are engaged in or provided efficiently, honestly and fairly, and by the Corporations Act in requiring financial advisers providing personal advice to retail clients to act in the best interests of the client and to prioritise the interests of the client when there is a conflict. These duties reflect the norms to provide services that are fit for purpose, to deliver services with reasonable care and skill, and when acting for another, to act in the best interests of that other. In the first substantive appellate discussion of the obligation in the Corporations Act to act efficiently, honestly and fairly, the provision was described as part of the statute's legislative policy to require social and commercial norms or standards of behaviour to be adhered to the rule in the section is directed to a social and commercial norm expressed as an abstraction. That's consistent with the view that was expressed in the explanatory memorandum that accompanied the introduction of this norm into the NCCPA, which considered that the obligation would require an assessment which reflects an appreciation of the needs to meet community standards of efficiency, honesty and fairness. So, once a norm of behaviour is identified, the detailed and prescriptive rules that follow in section 2912A of the Corporations Act are to be construed and applied by a court in a particular case, having assessed whether a body of conduct satisfied or failed to satisfy that norm of honesty, reasonableness and fairness. Section 912 capital A makes no reference to fitness for purpose or reasonable care and skill. But if it is accepted that these two are fundamental norms, then in assessing, for example, whether or not a licensee was competent or had adequate resources or took reasonable steps to ensure their representatives complied with the law, a court is to determine whether a body of conduct satisfied or failed to satisfy the norm simply ticking off the list of prescribed obligations in that section cannot answer the question whether, in all the circumstances and permutations of a particular transaction, a licensee did in fact comply with the standard of conduct to which that section is directed. And if that's true, might it not be both appropriate and sufficient to give statutory force to those norms of conduct by providing that a financial services licensee must provide financial services that are fit for purpose and deliver services with reasonable care and skill. If the fundamental norms are indeed properly understood as the statutory expression of a standard of expected community behaviour in commerce, as understood by reference to the principles and values of the common law and equity, 
No higher level of abstraction is required to inform the exhortations to obey the law, not to mislead or deceive, or to provide services that are fit for purpose, etc., etc. They readily contemplate requirements of honesty and fairness when dealing with consumers, the faithful performance of bargains and promises freely made, the rejection of trickery and sharp practice, the protection of those whose vulnerability places them in a position such that a just legal system will protect them from victimization or predation, the reversibility of enrichments unjustly received, and the importance of behavior in commerce that exhibits good faith and fair dealing. All are readily identifiable as falling within existing principles of common law and equity, most particularly those relating to unconscionable conduct, undue influence, mistake, duress, equitable fraud, and fiduciary obligations. The question then is whether attempts to describe conduct at yet a higher level of abstraction, in particular by exhortations to act fairly, will have the consequences of decoupling the norms from the anchoring principles and values of the common law and equity, allowing them to float amongst broad standards of morality, fairness and justice, thereby risking descent into moral and distributive justice, lacking stability and consistency. So what is to be made of the interaction between the fundamental norms of behaviour and the equitable doctrines and principles? whether as enacted by statute or as generally applicable. Presumably, to obey the law is an expression of a social standard of behaviour that extends to obeying all law, not merely the particular provisions of the financial services legislation. Taken to its logical extension, behaviour that, for example, amounts to equitable fraud, undue influence or duress in the provision of financial services would or should be assessed against this norm. There's nothing controversial about accepting as a binding principle or duty that when acting for another, one must act in the best interests of that other as prescribed by section 961 capital B of the Corporations Act. Such has been the classical understanding of fiduciary relationships as described by Justice Mason in Hospital Products and United States Surgical Corporation. However, what does it mean to say that within the framework of the financial services legislation, there is a fundamental norm and informing that binding principle or duty, a means by which the court can recognise and give effect to an expected standard of behaviour, namely to act fairly. Further, is there any distinction to be drawn between that norm and the obligation in the Corporations Act to provide services efficiently, honestly and fairly? Is such a norm expected to inform the interpretation of the prescription on unconscionable conduct and if so, to inform the interpretation of that prescription in relation to both the unwritten law and the statutory provision. Further, is such a norm expected to inform the interpretation of the statutory definition of unfair? A principled understanding and application of notions of conscience and unconscionability is of itself difficult enough, at least in the Australian context, without superimposing a norm of fairness. Havelock has observed that modern courts have not adopted consistent conceptions of what conscience means. Instead, the tendency is to invoke conscience and the variant form of unconscionability uncritically, as if it has and has always had a static meaning and role in equity. But that is not to deride the concept of conscience itself and its underpinning inequitable principles, still less to dismiss equity's essential role in commerce and in commercial litigation. So what of fairness? People who enter into contracts relating to financial products or financial services usually expect a financial return. When that does not happen, a disappointed person may be heard to say that the outcome was unfair. Does the fundamental norm to act fairly impose some immeasurable concept of fairness as between a financial product provider and a consumer or service recipient? Is fairness to be judged from the, the point of view of the consumer or the recipient or that of the provider or both? Is the contract prima facie unfair if the consumer does not achieve the objective 
of the product or service. Fairness cannot be about subjective views about which party ought to win. This was clear from some of the earliest criticisms of equity dating back to at least 1526, but was perhaps most famously said by John Selden in 1617. Equity is a roguish thing. For law, we have a measure, know what to trust to. Equity is according to the conscience of him who is chancellor, and as, as him is larger or narrower, so is equity. Tis all one as if they should make a standard for the measure we call a foot, to be the chancellor's foot. What an uncertain measure this would be. One chancellor has a long foot, another a short foot, a third an indifferent foot. Tis the same thing in the chancellor's conscience. In Mashinsky and Dodds, Justice Dean observed that long before that statement by John Selden, undefined notions of justice and what was fair had already given way in the law of equity to the rule of ordered principle, which is the essence of any coherent system of rational law. He went on to say that it is not to say that general notions of fairness and justice have become irrelevant to the content and application of equity, they remain relevant to the traditional equitable notion of unconscionable conduct, which persists as an operative component of some fundamental rules or principles of equity. Concerns about the indeterminacy of standards such as fair elsewhere in the law have been commonly aired. For example, in the context of equitable obligations, Professor Burks commented that the concept of fairness is so unspecific that it simply conceals a private intuitive evaluation. Similarly, Justice Beach has written in the context of statutory unconscionability that reference to intellectual ideas of customary morality and societal values without further delineation and ready identification may be at too high a level of abstraction to be an objective touchstone. If that be the case for fairness, it may give rise to rule of law concerns since it would mean that substantial discretion is reposed in judges to make moral evaluations free from meaningful constraint on matters about which reasonable people commonly disagree. As Chief Justice Dixon observed, intuitive feelings for justice seem a poor substitute for a rule antecedently known, more particularly when all do not have the same intuition. Albeit in an entirely different context, uh, that of compensation for native title claims, the full court of the federal court has, has observed that a process determined by intuition is open to criticism as lacking in predictability, transparency, and governed by subjectivity, personal proclivity, arbitrariness, and lack of confined boundaries. The difficulty with the scope of a norm of behavior to act fairly can be illustrated by some of the judicial attention that has been given to fairly in the context of efficiently, honestly, and fairly in ASIC and Westpac, the Chief Justice observed that the word fair in its adjectival form, directed to conduct, includes a meaning of free from bias, dishonesty or injustice, that which is legitimately sought, pursued, done, given, proper under the rules. In the same case, Justice O'Brien considered that there seemed to be no reason why it cannot carry its ordinary meaning, which includes an absence of injustice, even-handedness, and reasonableness. One criticism of such descriptions is that they merely invoke synonyms that are of little assistance because they simply re-express the concept of fairness in terms of other values and societal norms. As Justice Beach wrote when he was discussing the use of fairly in section 912 capital A, he said no dictionary definition could be adequate for the task given the intrinsic circularity with such definitions. Professor Joshua Anderson conceptualises fairness in three ways. First, that conduct is likely to be unfair if it involves the exploitation of another's vulnerability, as is comprehended by the law concerning unconscionable conduct. This is supported by case law, which has established that fairness imposes a lower moral or ethical standard than unconscionability, so that a party who has acted unconscionably by exploiting another's vulnerability would almost certainly have failed to act in a manner that was fair. Conceptualised in this way, a fundamental norm of behaviour to act fairly does not assist with understanding how it interacts with the normative standard that prescribes unconscionable conduct. <laughs> 
The second conception is fairness as the suppression of individual interest. This appears to be the conception of fairness reflected in the ASIC Act's unfair contract regime, which was also recognised by Professor Finn, who observed that one party's decision or action may bear so directly upon the interests of the other that basic fairness to the other may require that in some circumstances he should have regard to those interests in addition to his own and, if necessary, should desist from or modify the proposed course of action in consequence. Donald considers that this conception is reflected in the existing cases con concerning efficiently, honestly and fairly, which all involve situations in which the interests of the client have been adversely affected by the pursuit of a licensee's self-interest. The difficulty with this conception is the interaction of the norm with the statutory definition of unfair in section 12BG of the ASIC Act. Parliament has clearly expressed its intention as to what is meant by an unfair contract term in a consumer or small business contract. Is it to be contemplated that a court should apply some other notion of fairness informed by the court's idiosyncratic understanding of whether or not the transaction is fair? Anderson's third conception of fairness involves reciprocity in the sense of whether the terms of the impugned transaction are reasonable and both parties receive fair or agreed value. On this conception, arguably, conduct that is misleading or deceptive or the making of false or misleading representations would be unfair, since it indicates that a party has not received the agreed value of the transaction. If it is accepted that misleading or deceptive conduct is a fundamental norm of behaviour, the interaction with an additional norm of fairness is apt to contaminate the well-established jurisprudence in relation to misleading or deceptive conduct. But this conception of fairness resonates most clearly with a standard of behaviour in a business and consumer context that exhibits good faith and fair dealing. The demands of honest commerce conform with a degree of right behaviour. This conception is now largely, although not universally, recognised as an implication or feature of Australian contract law. If not fairness, then what? Unconscionability has become very much part of modern commercial jurisprudence, having been given statutory force in the ACL and the ASIC Act. In this way, the legislature has set a standard in Australian commerce of a form of decent behaviour by prohibiting conduct of a prescribed standard, just as it did when Section 52 of the TPA was first enacted. If modern commercial law is to be understood as fully encompassing the values that come from statute, the common law and equity, those equitable values should be comparably enacted thereby restricting the ability to contract out of behaving decently. In ASIC and Cobalt, Justice Gagler explained in relation to Section 12CB of the ASIC Act, the statutory unconscionability provision, that it operates to prescribe a normative standard of conduct which the section itself marks out and makes applicable in connection with the supply or possible supply of financial services. The function of a court exercising jurisdiction in a matter arising under the section is to recognise and administer the normative standard of conduct. The Commonwealth Parliament's appropriation in Section 12CB of the terminology of courts administering equity in the expression of the normative standard which the section prescribes serves to signify the gravity of the, con of the conduct necessary to be found by a court in order to satisfy a breach of that standard. To interpret the prescriptions on, un on unconscionable conduct by reference to a norm of fairness runs the risk of diluting the gravity of the equitable concept of unconscionable conduct so as to produce a form of equity light. It's worth recalling the matters that a court may have regard to as provided for in section 12 CC of the ASIC Act for determining whether a person has contravened the statutory unconscionability provision. They include the relative strength of bargaining power and whether the parties were able to understand the documents. That sounds very much like undue influence and unconscionable conduct. Whether any undue influence or pressure was exerted by either party. That sounds very much like duress. 
whether the extent to which either party failed to disclose various factors. That sounds like mistake or misrepresentation. The amount for which and circumstances in which equivalent services could be obtained in the parity of conduct with other recipients of the same services. That sounds a lot like equitable fraud. All of these factors sit comfortably within Anderson's third conception of fairness. A coherent body of principle concerned with good faith, fair dealing and conscious, conscience in commercial dealings must necessarily encompass the equitable doctrines of undue influence, duress, equitable fraud, mistake, misrepresentation, in addition to the existing statutory recognition of unconscionable conduct and fiduciary duties. Whether the scope of those principles is limited to the meaning of the unwritten law, as in section 21 of the ACL, or is given additional breadth is a policy choice, one that I suggest should be vigorously resisted so as yet to avoid further prescription. But a court directed to the equitable rules and principles, rather than to any social or commercial norm to act fairly, will not risk dissent into a formless void of personal intuition. The administration of equity has always paid regard to the infinite variety of interests and has refrained from formulating or adhering to fixed universal and exhaustive criteria with which to deal with such varying situations. The approach traditionally adopted by equity has been to re retain flexibility so as to accommodate the multitudinous instances in which the fundamental equitable rules fall to be applied. So it may be that the best hope for simplification of the financial services law, so as to ensure that there is meaningful compliance with the substance and intent of the law, will be through the restoration of the incremental development and application of equitable rules and principles through the commercial law and the removal of the prescription. The financial services legislation could make plain that its object is to enhance the integrity and stability of the financial services industry and to provide for consumer protection informed by common law and equitable principles of fair dealing and good conscience. This would enable the clear statutory expression of proscribed and prescribed standards of conduct without the need for prolix rulemaking that results in legislative porridge. In this way, we might counterintuitively enhance the certainty of the commercial law. For as Plato wrote in his seventh letter, the soul seeks to know not the quality, but the essence. Whereas each of these four instruments, the name, the definition, the image, knowledge, reason, and right opinion, presents to the soul in discourse and examples what she is not seeking, and thus makes it easy to refute by sense, perception, anything that may be said or pointed out, and fills everyone, so to speak, with perplexity and confusion. I should also have heeded Plato's warning in a later passage of that same letter that anyone who is seriously studying high matters will be the last to write about them. But I thank you nonetheless for your polite attention. Thank you very much, Professor Derrington. Uh, this evening wouldn't have happened without the gener generous support of those whom I'm about, about to acknowledge. First and foremost, the star of the show, our guest speaker, the Honourable Justice Sarah Derrington. I know that uh, this excellent presentation uh, required a great deal of effort and commitment at a very busy time for you. Uh, last year, this lecture was delivered to a physical audience of only 30 people not because of the quality of the speaker, I hasten to add, but uh, because of the pandemic. But how wonderful it is to now have returned to normality and, and have a full uh, room in this wonderful Banco Court to hear this fine presentation. Justice Derrington, your lecture will provide a useful and permanent contribution to the law and uh, the concept of fairness in the developing area of consumer protection legislation. I was thinking as I listened to it of uh, something attributed to an English law lord, and I can't remember now who it was or whether it was said in a judgment or extrajudicially, but so, I'm sure some of you might know, but on these related topics and 
uh, and it, it was um, just remember the dirty dog doesn't win <laughs> and uh, I, th I think that's not a bad yardstick. <laughs> um, so uh, we really appreciate you, you making time in your very busy life to share your insights this evening. Please join me in thanking our guest speaker. Although Tony Lee, now in his 92nd year, was unable to attend in person, what a delight to see the video which captured the essence of this charming and erudite legal academic in whose honour this lecture is given. Uh, I, under, I understand um, that uh, every day, straight after his morning swim, he still scans the internet for the latest trust cases. Uh, so in absentia, thank you, Tony, for all you've done in this sphere of learning and for that slightly wicked video. I <laughs> uh, also thank the Chief Justice in absentia for allowing us to again host this e event in such a special space. The Chief Justice has been a great supporter of this lecture series, both as a past speaker and uh, as a host over many years. I hope this con connection will continue in some form after her pending retirement in March. And I also thank her for her support and her fine work as Chief Justice of Queensland over the past six years. My next, next thank you is to our wonderful sponsors, the University of Queensland, De Groot Wills and Estates Lawyers, and Queensland Community Foundation, whose Board of Governor, Governors I have the honour to chair. Thank you, University of Queensland, for sponsoring this important lecture, Professor Bigwood. Um, it's always an intellectual legal triumph, as indeed it was tonight, and your sponsorship, Professor, is uh, especially fitting given that Tony Lee uh, began his Queensland legal academic career there where he taught many of us, including our guest speaker. I thought she was too young, but <laughs> there you are. Our guest speaker, the Chief Justice, uh, me and many others here tonight. Thank you to, to De Groot's Wills and Estates lawyers. Margot and John De Groot are here tonight. John has been a great uh, friend to this lecture series and to Tony Lee. John organised the video that we saw, and John has been on the Board of Governors of Queensland Community Foundation for many years. It's fitting that Queensland Community Foundation sponsors this annual equity lecture. The concept of, its, of equity in its broadest sense encompasses a notion of social inclusion and, as we heard tonight, fairness. As Queensland's largest public pub perpetual tr charitable trust, with a corpus of around $114 million and growing, QCF is committed to a socially inclusive Queensland, now and forever. This coming year, QCF, through its 222 sub-funds, both legacies and from living donors, and its general fund, will distribute a record $4.5 million to Queensland charities working to build community resilience, something that we really need uh, after and with this ongoing pandemic. We encourage a give where you live philosophy through our regional sub-funds and regional committees in Toowoomba, the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast. QCF also celebrates and encourages Queensland philanthropy generally, not just QCF-focused philanthropy, with its pre prestigious annual philanthropy awards and the Philanthropy in Focus Photographic Challenge. This year's focus was on kindness and you'll see the winning photograph uh, outside in the lobby after in, in a moment when you're um, sharing drinks and, and chatting about fairness. Um, uniquely, QCF's generous sponsorship from the public trustee, QIC and Anglo-American, means that every tax doc deductible do not dollar donated to QCF goes straight to its capital fund, providing a perpetual income stream for charities right across the va this vast state. The sponsorship makes QCF the ideal vehicle for you or your clients to establish the gift that keeps on giving, either through a tax-deductible donation to the QCF General Fund or by establishing your own named charitable sub-fund, whether by legacy or as a living donor, all without any expensive setup or ongoing costs or worries. Of particular interest to this audience may be a QCF sub-fund established with an eye to the long-term future by Law Rights Civil Justice Fund. The law, uh, through Law Right, over 800 lawyers from 64 law, law firms, 170 barristers and 140 law students donate 30,000 pro bono hours to help clients access their legal rights around housing, income and health and wellbeing. Uh, 
Imagine if we can grow that fund to supply the wonderful law right with an income stream independent of government to allow it to do its work in the future. And as the Chief Justice said, to help achieve this, we're selling raffle tickets for a Paspali Pearls $5,000 pearl gift voucher and a pearl discovery experience for the winner and four friends. Um, please be generous and uh, buy tickets if you haven't done so already. You can do it either online, and I'm sure someone will be selling them outside tonight. And now, most importantly, and if you want to know how to, you do a, a plug for something, that's, <laughs> that's what you do. You just spruik. <laughs> you were very modest. <laughs> and uh, and last, but most importantly, thank you all for making time to join us for this special evening. Thank you.